Hello everyone, welcome back. This is our lecture on life cycle costing. So we're still looking at different costing methods. So methods that we can use to set the cost of a product. So this one is called life cycle costing. What are we talking about when we talk about life cycle costing? Well, we're talking about looking at a product over the whole of its life cycle. So we'll no longer split up each of our periods of time into months, years, etc., etc. What we'll do is we'll look at the accumulated costs over the product's life. And that means from right at the very start, from the research and development phase, through to the removal of that product from the market. So we're not thinking about periods of time splitting up our costs into those periods of time. We're thinking about taking the total cost of the product over its life cycle from the start right through to the end. So the life cycle for a product can be split into five distinct phases that we'll discuss shortly. The five phases will be development, introduction, growth, maturity, and decline. And you need to learn those five phases. As I said, I'm gonna show you a graph and we'll discuss them shortly. And remember that the life cycle will be different for different products. Not all products will have the same life cycle. Some will have a very short life cycle. Some will have a very long life cycle. So not all products will have the same life cycle. The key concepts we need to remember when we're looking at life cycle costing is that we are no longer looking at accounting periods. We're not thinking about periods of time, a month, a year, etc., etc. What we're doing is looking at the whole of the product's life cycle. We're going to estimate what the costs are going to be across that entire life cycle. And that will then enable us to set a better price for our product. So let's look at what we're talking about when we talk about allocating the costs to a product over its life cycle. So look at illustration one, have a read through it, and then either have a go yourself or work through it with me. Illustration one looks at a product with a four year life cycle and we're given the various costs split down into the life cycle of that product. So let's first of all get down the phases that we're looking at for this product. So we're gonna have research and development costs, design costs, product costs, marketing costs, distribution costs and customer service costs. And all of those costs are gonna be incurred in different periods. What we need to do for life cycle costing is to add up the total costs that we're going to incur over the life cycle of the product. So for research and development costs, we incur 300 in year one. And that gives us a total of 300 because we don't have any others. Design, we have 200 in year two and no others again, total 200. Product costs then begin in year two and we have 75, 90 and 90. Add those across to get 255. Marketing costs are 70, 50 and 30, giving us a total marketing cost of 150 over the life cycle of the product. Distribution costs were 20, 27, 24. Again, that adds up to 71 for total distribution costs over the life cycle of the product. And customer service costs were 15, 23 and 30 to give us total customer service costs over the life cycle of the product of 68. So that gives us the total life cycle costs, adding up our total column to 1044. So that's what we're doing with life cycle costing, where rather than splitting out the costs per year, we're saying, right, what is the total cost for this product over its life cycle? Now that we've seen how to allocate those costs out to a product across its life cycle, Let's talk in a little bit more detail about those five phases of the life cycle. So the phases, as I said, were five, and we can graph them like this. So we have the research and development phase, introduction, growth, maturity, and decline, and they're all set out along the bottom of our graph. Halfway up the graph, we have the zero point, and what we're looking here is at the top, the purple line, we're looking at sales. The bottom blue line is looking at profit, so at the start, in the research and development phase, we have zero sales because we're not selling anything because the product hasn't come to market yet. And we can see that our profit is going down, i.e. we're making a loss. Well, that's obvious because we're spending money on research and development, but we haven't had any sales yet. So costs with no revenue means that we're losing money. 
So our profit is going down. It's negative. We're making a loss. So until the introduction phase where we start making some sales, that profit will not start to go up. So at that introduction phase, we can see sales begin and the profit, instead of continuing to go down, starts to go up, but we're still making a loss. At the point where we cross the zero line with our blue line there, our profit, that will be our break even point. So as our sales grow towards the growth phase, that's when we'll start to make an actual profit. We'll cross the break even line and start to make a profit. After growth, we then start to see maturity. So this is where we still get growing sales. We're still making profit, but we're making less. That feeds through into a decline where sales start to decrease, profit starts to decrease, and eventually we'll have a loss-making product. So for the purposes of the exam, be able to draw out that diagram, because if you can draw that diagram, you can discuss it. And if you can discuss that, you'll get full marks on a discussion-based question for life cycle costing. So that's the diagram. Let's look at each of these phases, starting with development. So some of the things we have to realize are that the costs that are incurred at this phase will be research and development costs, so investigations, questionnaires, um, testing, those sorts of things. We also will have some capital investment. So we'll have to invest maybe in new machinery, new equipment to do the testing, to do the research, and to develop the product. We may also have to train our staff. So training will begin at that stage. And that again will be another cost that will be incurred. So all of those costs are being incurred in the research and development phase. But remember, we're not making any revenue yet. We're not actually selling anything. So that's the point at which we'll be making a loss. So at this point, our product is loss making. Do be aware for the purposes of your discussion that the research and development phase can take up a large percentage of total costs of a product. Some research has shown that in this phase, up to 90% of the total life cycle costs of a product can be incurred. So it's crucial that you focus on these research and development phases to make them as short as possible, to try and reduce the amount of costs incurred at that phase. So we want to try to minimize as far as possible our research and development phase. Once we get out of our development phase, we'll have a product and we'll have to introduce that product to the market. So once we introduce that product to the market, we'll have some uh, additional costs in addition to the ones in the development phase. Because we have to introduce it to the market, it'll be an unknown product. So we'll require some marketing to make the product aware or to make the public aware of the product. So in the introduction to the market, it'll be unknown. So we need to market it and that's going to be costly. So the costs incurred at this stage will be our advertising and marketing costs. But we'll also maybe have some training costs if we're going to ramp up production. We'll have to train the staff to get that production going. You'll also start to get your production and distribution costs because we've introduced the product to the market. So that means we need to supply it to the market. So we'll have costs involved in producing the product and distributing it. So those are our costs in the introduction phase. We then move into the growth phase. During this phase, our revenues will begin to build. So we'll start to see our revenues increase and we should see the product move into profit. Also, we'll start to see economies of scale, i.e. our cost per unit of production should decrease because the more we produce, the lower we can get the price of the product. So we can take advantage of bulk discounts, for example, to buy our raw materials in bulk and get them cheaper. And that will all lead through into us being able to reduce the cost of production for each unit. The costs that we'll be incurring during the growth phase well, we'll start to have some inventory holding costs because we'll produce extra, we'll have it in inventory before it's distributed. And we'll also have our production and distribution costs that will be continuing from the introduction phase. So that's our growth phase. We then move into our maturity phase. So during this maturity phase, we'll find that demand will slow for the product. Remember, demand can't go on at the same level forever. So demand will begin to decrease. Now what we could do to try and 
uh, react to that is to maybe adapt or improve the product. So maybe we bring out a different version or we change it a little bit to try and boost our sales again. So that's one thing we can do during the maturity phase. We also have to make a choice. We have to choose whether to reduce our marketing or not. Now, if we reduce our marketing, we run the risk of damaging demand for the product and we may push the, the product into our next phase, the decline phase. So we have to make that choice. We need to choose, do we reduce our marketing and maybe push it into decline? Or do we increase our marketing and maybe keep it in the majority phase where we can still make profit? That's a choice that the business will have to make. The final phase of the product is the decline phase. In the decline phase, we'll see lower demand and we'll see the market losing interest in the product. However, do be aware that this decline phase could be very long. We could find that there's low demand for a product, but we're still able to make profit on it. So we still produce it. So it may be a very long phase of production. However, do be aware as well that in the end, the product is likely to turn into a loss maker. Once it does, well then we probably choose to pull the market or pull the product from the market. Those phases then can be brought forward into calculations. So these have been introduced recently, calculations on life cycle costing. So what we'll need to do is calculate our total cost over our life cycle. We can then allocate those costs to the units that we expect to produce, and that will give us an accurate cost for the product. Now, what we can do is once we've got that cost per unit, well then we can set the price per unit that we want to achieve to try and cover those costs. So let's see how this is done. Let's look at illustration two in your workbook. If you read through the illustration and either have a go and attempt it or work through it with me. Illustration two gives us a breakdown of some information that the CEO has given us to say what should be charged for a product. So looking at it, we can see that he's basically used the first year's figures to calculate a cost per unit. So what we need to do is calculate the life cycle cost of the product and suggest an alternative price. So using the same method that we did in the illustration one, let's calculate the life cycle cost. So the first cost we have here, research and development. Well, that's only in the development phase and it is 200. We then have marketing costs. We're given the marketing costs and they are 50 million in the introduction phase, 40 in growth, 20 in maturity and four in decline. Lastly, we have the production costs. So in the introduction phase, we have production costs per unit of $4. We have production volume of 2 million. So $4 times 2 million gives 8 million as our production costs. In the growth phase, we have $3.50 times 5 million units of production, which is 17.5 million of costs. Maturity phase, we have $3 of a cost times 10 million of production is 30 million of costs. And in the decline phase, we have $3.20 as our cost per unit times 4 million produced gives us 12.8 million of costs. So that enables us to get a total. So for the development phase, we have 200. For the introduction phase, we have 50 plus 8 is 58 million. For growth, we have 40 plus 17.5, 57.5. Maturity, 20 plus 30 is 50. And decline, 4 plus 12.8 gives 16.8. So those are all our costs in each phase. We need to get a total product cost. So over the life cycle, we have the total costs, adding those all together of 382.3 million. Now we need to see how many units we're gonna produce in total. And we have total production of 2 million, 5 million, 10 million, and 4 million. Adding those all up gives us 21 million. So what we need to do is allocate, allocate the total life cycle costs to each of those units. So the cost per unit will be the 382.3 divided by the 21, which is $18.20. And looking at the cost that the CEO had suggested of $54, we can see that that is a significant difference. And you can already start to see the difference that life cycle costing can do whenever we're looking at a product. 
Now that we've looked at the calculations for life cycle costings, we need to be able to discuss their implications. So there are some implications we need to understand for pricing. First of all, under traditional methods of costing. Well, under traditional methods of costing, we often write off research and development costs in the period in which they're incurred. So we look at where we've incurred our research and development costs and we write them off during that time. Now what that means is that we're writing off new research and development costs, i.e. research and development costs on new products, against the revenue that's being generated by the old products that are also through their introduction and into their growth phase. So we're generating the revenue from old products, but we're writing off the research and development costs from new products against that revenue. And what that means is that it can make the old products look less profitable because we're writing that research and development cost off against their revenue. Now that doesn't happen under life cycle costing. Under life cycle costing, rather than allocating the costs to a period of time, we allocate the costs to the product over its life cycle. The product is then priced up to cover the life cycle costs and we can uh, use that data to determine whether it's covering those costs or not. Also when it comes to performance within the business, well life cycle costing enables the business to recognize the fact that up to 90% of their costs will be in the research and development phase. So what that means is that they can focus on making that phase as short as possible and getting those products to market as quickly as possible so that they start to generate revenue. It also enables them to track costs through the life cycle of the product so they can see overall whether this product is profitable or not. It also enables the business to focus on early decisions again by understanding that a lot of the costs are incurred at the research and development phase so they can see that any of those decisions that are made early on in the product feed through into costs later on that they need to cover through revenue. So it enables the business to focus on those early decisions to make sure that they get them right. And ultimately, it can minimize the time that it takes to get the product to market because the business has an understanding of what the life cycle of the product is or is likely to be. So the advantages of this are that it gives more efficient resource allocation because you can allocate the resources to the products that are going to make the most profit over their life cycle. We track costs to products rather than to time and that enables us again to understand whether the product is profitable or not. And it identifies that relationship between the research and development phase and the ultimate cost of the product and that is crucial for the business to understand. So that was our lecture on life cycle costing. Make sure you attempt the test your understanding questions at the end of your workbook chapter and then do any past paper questions. Make sure that you understand this topic thoroughly.